Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the third of the JCU webinar series on COVID. I'm Peter Antigue and delighted to welcome tonight Emma McBride and Diana Rogers Alberas. Um, very pleased to do the webinar tonight on exit strategies. Before we start, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of all the lands in which we meet tonight and to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Next slide, please. Just a reminder to the audience, you are all muted automatically, so you don't have to worry about that. If you could please use the Q&A um, little button at the bottom middle of your screen there to ask any questions. If you have any technical problems, please use chat and one of the moderators will, um, will talk you through what's going on. Next slide, please. Essentially, what we're going to do tonight is look at the very topical topic of exit strategies. And the way we're going to do that is to have a look at some of the epidemiological evidence uh, and emerging evidence for these strategies and also have a look at the treatments and have an update on vaccines and where we are with that at the minute. So without further ado, I will hand over to Emma. Thank you. Can everybody hear me OK? All right, we better move on. OK, so I'm Emma McBride. I'm uh, an infectious diseases specialist and mathematical modeler and I work at James Cook University. Thank you very much for having me today. So just to uh, frame the talk I'm going to give, I'm going to start with a quick recap of the epidemiology and public health actions to date and then I'm going to talk about how modeling has guided the policy to the point we are now and then of course future modeling and how modeling can help us in this period where we are looking at coming out of lockdown. And this is, of course, the exit strategies associated with uh, coronavirus. Uh, this is probably a very familiar site to everybody. It's the uh, Johns Hopkins data dashboard. Uh, and uh, I look at it several times every day. And of course, at the moment, the cases are being dominated by the US and also Europe. Uh, but I will do a quick look back about how we got to this point. And um, I very much recommend this site. Uh, a lot of other sites use this as their raw data source. So next one click, please. So just to recap, um, of course, so, so this will be very familiar to all of you, but I think just setting the scene, we had some cases of severe acute respiratory virus-like illness in late, in early December. Uh, the first case is believed to have occurred either in late November or early December last year. By New Year's Eve, the scientists and doctors were already voicing their concerns internationally. On the 6th of January, the viral sequence was published. And on that same date, the WHO issued its first alert. Uh, the WHO then uh, declined to issue a public health emergency of international concern on the 22nd, but did so on the 29th. By then, Wuhan was in full lockdown. Uh, so, WHO in February advised against travel and trade restrictions, but did escalate its concern about the virus and ask countries to uh, begin mobilization. By late February, the epidemic was already starting to shift and move to South Korea, followed by Iran, Italy. And then by the end of February, the global cases were beginning to outnumber the cases uh, the global cases other than China were beginning to outnumber China and then of course in March the epidemic shifted uh, to essentially be around Europe and the United States. So up the top in, in orange here I've described Australia's response in terms of travel ban and its response to the outside world. So banned travel to China in early February with um, a fair bit of uh, criticism and pushback for that. By early March, travel had been banned to Iran, South Korea, and Italy. By mid-March, all travelers were asked to self-isolate. Uh, sequentially, that was followed by um, closing borders to all non-citizens. And then finally, hotel quarantine on the 27th of March. Next slide, please. This, this data set is also based on the Johns Hopkins data, but it's quite nice because it's been log transformed. So you can see, here's Australia. And there was essentially, you, you get to be on this um, when you have at least 100 cases. So that happened to us around the 10th, 11th of March. And essentially for most of March, we had linear growth on the log scale. In other words, exponential growth. And then by the end of March, we had turned a corner and were having a much flatter um, 
epidemic. And then uh, now you can see we're really on the horizontal, so not incrementing at all. Australia, uh, I'm now going to talk about the way Australia responded in terms of at home as opposed to what it did with overseas and imported cases. Large gatherings were, were banned in on the 13th of March. And then that was preceded by a change in uh, requ requirements for smaller gatherings. They could only have one person per four metres squared. And this was quickly followed by uh, banning all social gatherings, including things like pubs and restaurants and, and hotels. And finally, incrementally increased uh, both by, by both states and by the federal government until on the 30th of March, there was home lockdown. So you can see that these decisions were all sort of being made throughout the exponential increase. Um, and it's gonna be hard to tease out what made the difference here uh, purely by looking at the timeline. I would like to just draw everyone's attention to Australia's timeline and look at countries that are very different and similar to Australia. So we have, I think we're most similar to South Korea in this timeline, which is this, which is just above Australia, and um, but but they've been going for a lot longer. So so you can see it going through. If you look at um, Singapore and Japan, they have very different epidemics. They look like they're doing extremely well early on, but you can see they just uh, haven't changed their trajectory at all. It's just a straight uh, line, albeit a less steep line, suggesting that they are now undergoing continued exponential growth in the epidemic. And this isn't much talked about by most people in the media, for example, but Vietnam have, and they're right down the bottom there, you can see have done extraordinarily well in their epidemic so far and they've done that through a lot of testing and contact tracing activities. Next slide please. Okay so now I want to talk about modelling uh, and before I talk about shifting the curve or flattening the curve I'll just quickly cover off on a very important modelling concept which is the reproduction number. So the basic reproduction number is the typical number of infections that a single case makes at the start of an epidemic when everyone's susceptible. It should be fairly self-evident that if that number is bigger than one, so let's say a typical number um, is two to three, and that repeats itself cyclically, you're going to get exponential growth. All right. Now, the effective reproduction number is when uh, time has gone on and either through uh, susceptible people becoming immune or through interventions, that number declines. It's no longer called the basic reproduction number, but the effective reproduction number. So that's a really important concept in modeling. In, in early Wuhan, this number was about 2.4. And a lot of mitigation strategies were, have, have tried to uh, look at what would happen if we got that down to 1.6 or maybe 1.2. So I'm gonna talk about a, a one third reduction and a one half reduction in infectiousness. And that's what I mean by that. And even a two thirds reduction, which is getting it down to 0 0.8, which you'll note is under one. All right, just, uh, just to orientate you. So let's talk about flattening the curve. And this is something that I've been pushing against as, a, as, as an aim. This was produced by the Centers for Disease Control in the United States. And it shows a very peaky uh, curve of infection. It was basically, this was made a couple of years ago. It was meant to mimic what could happen in a pandemic influenza outbreak, not a coronavirus outbreak because essentially there's so much um, asymptomatic spreading that no one really thought they could control a pandemic flu. So what you see is this really peaky curve and then a, a different curve, one that's been shifted, it's later, it's much lower, but in fact, it's still an epidemic curve. So clearly in this lower curve, the, the effective reproduction number is above one and there's still a lot of people who are, who are in this epidemic. Um, so when that's translated over to COVID, uh, and next click please, uh, this was done by Imperial College uh, and they looked at the impact, the, the expected uh, outcome for the United States and for Great Britain, this is about five weeks ago, and they essentially said, even with substantial mitigation, this is going to look extremely bad for us. So they looked at uh, reducing the uh, infectiousness, the reproduction number uh, by a third and by a half and uh, the impact is is really um, 
not an acceptable outcome. So in Australia, if we went for a one third reduction in infectiousness, we could get the peak down um, to, but we would still see an overwhelming um, problem with our health service uh, with about 150 uh, cases expected, um, 150,000 cases in intensive care um, at the, in hospital at the peak and 50,000 cases in intensive care at the peak. So that compares with our actual um, capacity, which is only at the moment um, before COVID, it was only 2,200 2, intensive care beds in Australia. And with some boosting of capacity, it could go up to 4,000. Uh, so Emma, just to clarify, was similar yep. modeling to what Imperial College used for these slides, was that applied in a similar way to the Australian context? And that's where those modeling numbers came from? That's correct, yeah. Thank you. So we using the same um, expected behaviour of the virus in terms of how long people remain infectious for, how infectious people were, that was then applied to Australia. And then if we got the infectiousness down to, to this basic reproduction number of 1.2, what we saw is a flattening that was just able to be managed by the health service. So the intensive care beds would be completely full, but not overflowing, if you like. Um, but to get it to that level, that's a, that's a reproduction number of 1.2, we would be looking at the peak arriving in the middle of next year, so July 2021, and the, the epidemic is still going in, July 20, in January 2022. So I think everyone can probably um, accept that that's, none of that is, is a very acceptable outcome. So the alternative is to try and aim a little bit higher and try and get the reproduction number, or aim a bit lower for the reproduction number, try and get it under one. So those strategies can be uh, classified as either intermittent uh, strategies where you allow a few people to get infected and once it hits a certain threshold, you put the brakes on and go from a reproduction number of 2.4 down to 0.8 and then keep that control strategy until you see a, a very strong decline and then relax again. And, and Imperial College post, you know, proposed this as a potential way to, to avoid economic catastrophe, although uh, in those circumstances, the brakes are on more often than they're off. Uh, the other alternative is just to go for a, a reproduction number below one and to keep it there. So that's real sort of suppression for elimination strategy. Um, and in that case, there's essentially no epidemic at all. So the, there's a vast difference between uh, what happens when the reproduction number is 0.8, which is essentially nothing happens, versus 1.2, which seems, in terms of people's behaviour and the policies needed to re to achieve that, is very is not very different. But the outcome is enormously different. And I know you're going to come to this later, but my understanding is that Australia the reproduction rate is somewhere at about 0.8 at the moment. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm going to come to this now. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> so that's cool. All right, next slide, please. All right, we'll, we'll talk about this for a second. So I just, I hope this is not everything. Um, so, the, so I just want to show people who might be interested. This, the, uh, this is the simplest model uh, I could construct that would replicate the results of the Imperial model, which was a really, really complicated model that had every single person in the UK or the US um, included in the model, and they all had lives, they had houses, they had schools, and they went about their business. So it was called an agent-based model. And this is a much simpler version of the model. And it's really not rocket science. You start off susceptible, that's the S, and then there's an exposed category E1, E2. By the time you move into E2, you might be infectious. And then I is for infectious. So E is basically incubating, I is infectious, and then recovery, and we assume that allows for immunity, which may not be the case. We can talk about that later. Some people in the symptomatic infectious period may go to hospital and some of them may go to ICU. So that's a really simple model, um, but it was very much sufficient to replicate the much more complicated models that are around. Just wanted to show you that. Okay, uh, so we calibrated the model to the known flows um, and then also to look at different levels of infectiousness as well. Next slide, please. Okay, all right. So this is where we actually, rather than just looking at scenarios, what if 
what if um, the effective reproduction number was something, what would happen? We're actually trying to calibrate it to the Australian data. So here in blue is the local cases in Australia and in the sort of brown are the imported cases in Australia. And in this uh, calibration, what I've done is allowed the reproduction number to be 2.4 up until the 27th of March when the sort of lockdown became really serious. Um, and I've allowed that um, the imported cases that were known to be imported uh, weren't as infectious as the local cases as well. And then from the point of the 27th of March, I've projected forward uh, according to different effective reproduction numbers. And, what, and, and I'm just projecting forward the local cases because right now, I think the imported cases are really not having an impact on our epidemic. They're all going into uh, lockdown and essentially we shouldn't really be counting them. We really want to know what's happening with our local cases. And what you can see is our local cases are kind of tracking just about an R effective of 0 0.8. All right, so that's, that's how the model is calibrating at the moment. That's not a formal statistical analysis of, of what the reproduction number is, but the next, uh, if you just click once, please, the next uh, slide is a formal statistical analysis of what's happening with real-time estimates for, for the reproduction number in Australia. And yes, 0 0.8 is about right. And it varies according to state. You can see here um, in Tasmania, there's been a, an uptick. And I guess that might happen to Queensland as well in the next week or so. But with the hospital outbreak in Tasmania, that was to be expected. But overall, for most states, we're tracking it below one, but it's pretty close to one. It's not sort of really comfortably below one necessarily. Okay. Emma, can I ask you, yeah. just interject, there has been an audience question just going back to the slide where you showed this, the, this as the simplest model that you could of how um, we do the modeling. Mm. And the question was, uh, the, where was the death rate calculation within that very model? You know, you had the yeah, exposure. Um, it is there. So if you want to, if we can go back, essentially it's not a compartment, but everyone, if, if we know that everyone who's infected on average, if we, if we can accept that 0.9% or if we, if we scale it to Australia's age distribution, 0.86% of people die, we really have to go back to the one Sorry. that is Model. Previous slide, Green, um, just one more slide. That's yeah, that one. Yeah. We uh, believe that point, about 0.8% point of people die. Uh, as people move into this removed phase, we can say uh, most of them recover, but 0.8% of them die, and you can calculate the expected death from that. So, so, so just to clarify, the, you mm -hmm. would include that in the R, the removed includes recovered as well as, as deceased Correct. in that model. Thank you. Yep. yep. Okay. Sorry, please skip forward to the next uh, slide. So, yep, that one uh, and beyond. One more. Okay, that's great. So given that we're at point eight, maybe, uh, you know, tentatively, we think our uh, effective reproduction number may be below one. Where does that leave us? So obviously, that's a great outcome from the point of view of trying to control this epidemic. And still, I think it's a little bit early to be absolutely celebrating. Uh, but where does that leave us? So here's, um, and, and I think everyone knows about the discussion that's been going on about herd immunity. Um, this is a graph where the vertical axis goes up to 25 million or so, which is the population of Australia. And then the green line shows how, we, what, how many people need to be um, susceptible in order to have herd immunity. So if we can get under the green line, then we have herd immunity. Herd immunity means there's enough people who are um, no longer susceptible that we can actually protect the whole population of um, the country uh, even if people, even if a, if a proportion of people remain susceptible. Um, okay, so we're basically cocooning people by having a lot of people who are removed from the epidemic and they're now immune. That's of course assuming that immunity is, is uh, something we can achieve for COVID-19. All right, but here's what happens in the unmitigated epidemic. There's the black line, the thick black line. Now you see it reaches herd immunity very quickly by about mid-July and then kind of overreaches herd immunity. Um, and, um, and so we could expect herd immunity under those circumstances, but 
at a great cost. This is like 80% of the Australian population can expect to be infected and you just multiply 80% by um, 0.8% and you can work out how many people are, um, are likely to die. Emma, can I bring another audience question? In fact, it's the same mm -hmm. person who's talking about this. Um, pointing out that the death rate in ICU patients appears to be much higher than 0.8%. And I wonder if this speaks to what we were talking about earlier was the vexed question of asymptomatic carriage and population prevalence. Um, when you say the death rate is 0.8%, that's based on everything we understand. Yeah. It's not 0.8% of all infected people. So the case fatality rate is higher than that. But that just depends on how good you are at defining a case. So it's much more variable, right? So in some places, the case fatality rate seems to be as high as 10% or something like that. In other places, it's it's 1.5%. And I think that really depends on how hard you're looking for cases. But the, um, the modelled infection fatality rate is 0.8%. And so that's what I've gone with for my model. Modeled um, as in what ICU, everything? okay, much likely more likely to be in that point eight percent. Thank you. Right. Um, so, if you reduce the infectiousness by a third, that's the dashed line here. You sort of creep towards herd immunity, but again, uh, so if you reduce the R effective to 1.6, so that's by a third, uh, you go from 80% of the population being infected to about 60% of the population being infected. So even though the, the peak is later and it's smaller, it's still a really massive epidemic. And that's the point I'm trying to make. And even at 1.2, so that's reducing the infectiousness by half, we have an epidemic about a quarter of Australia is estimated to be infected. So vastly more than we're seeing at the moment. Um, approximately, you know, more than we're seeing in the whole world at the moment with an R effective of 1.2. And it, as I said, would, would peak in late sort of 2021 and not be over until well into 2022. All right, so that's that. And would not even achieve herd immunity if herd immunity can, is measured as per this green line. Then finally, the, um, the this um, total suppression strategy which is the blue line. I'm uh, sorry, the, sorry, they're both the blue line. Really, The intermittent strategy is the blue line and then the dash dot line that's with the blue line is the total suppression strategy. So you can see we're, we're not even um, making a dent in the number of people who are susceptible in Australia with our suppression strategy. So there is no herd immunity, all right? That's the bottom line. If you control the epidemic, there is no herd immunity. And even if you sort of let it go and then pull it back like might happen in the UK and US and Europe, I'm, I'd be very surprised if there's herd immunity there either. Um, okay, so next slide. All right, so that brings us to the options for the future for, for what I'm calling sort of the lucky countries. There's really four options. Um, we can aim for total elimination and lockdown as a country, uh, which would mean making sure that no one with COVID-19 comes into our country and spreads COVID in the community. If we did that, of course, we could possibly be a bit more freer within Australia. Um, the other, the next sort of most um, uh, sort of slightly less uh, control option would be to aim for suppression with the reproduction number less than one, um, but not total elimination. And we could try and lift the most stringent measures and then see how that goes. Um, but then we would be, as, as we know, we'd be looking at continuing uh, some kind of uh, suppression for at least until a vaccine is ready or until we change our mind or until something um, that, you know, there's some other uh, em emergent way of managing things. And then, the, um, and then the less attractive options were, are to allow a mitigated epidemic, and in which case we might want to segregate the population by age and risk group, or an unmitigated epidemic. So there are sort of essentially broad options. Next. Thank you. Diana, before we go from there, I know that, Diana, you're going to be talking about vaccines and so on in a minute, but did you have any comment you'd like to make about these options at the, at the minute? 
Well, when I, when I will talk about the vaccines, I think we have to take into account, as Emma mentioned, the duration of immunity against coronaviruses. And I think that is, that is very important. So as we know, coronaviruses are the cause of the common cold. And we usually don't have long immunity against coronaviruses. So that might be an issue if we wait for the vaccine for too long. We might, we might have to wait for, for a while. Thank you. And Emma, I, a question that came up and I've been thinking about as well is that the assumption is that herd immunity is ongoing, but there, that is a question, isn't it? A question mark at how long that herd immunity might last for. Would that be right? Oh, absolutely. So uh, first of all, immunity may not last lifelong. It may only last um, a year or two or, or not at all. And secondly, uh, if you look at every other um, of the viruses that we have vaccines for now, um, as people are born, they, um, they, the whole of society loses its herd immunity and you get sort of cyclical outbreaks in, in the very young. And we've seen that with, with measles and with um, smallpox in, in days before the vaccines were available. Uh, yeah. Another question, and you may be coming to this, is um, could all these options apply equally within zonal or regional construct within Australia? So, you know, you, you could decide to have one area would go into complete lockdown, but another might be more free. Uh, there's been some modelling around yeah. that or thoughts around that. I think, I think that's definitely true, uh, but I think there'd be some of these four that are incompatible with each other. So you couldn't have lock, or we couldn't have um, sort of lockdown and then a neighbouring area having an unmitigated epidemic without a lot of problems, I think. So yes, I think what we might see is some parts of Australia wanting to be completely um, eliminating the virus where, where others aim for suppression. I don't think Australia is looking at the latter two though. Thank you. And just before we move on, um, can we talk about herd immunity if recovered, if recovered patients are reinfected, if it appears, do we know, are they reinfected or are they still just showing signs of the infection because it hasn't been cleared? Do we have that information? Yeah, it's, I, I don't think the data's in yet. And I think it's a real word of caution for anyone talking about herd immunity, but I don't think we should be aiming for herd immunity. So I think uh, that's kind of a moot point in a way. All right, thank you. Why don't you move on and we'll take some okay. questions in a minute. All right, so um, next slide, please. And uh, this is where I want to talk about how modelling might be able to help us come out of lockdowns. So here's this uh, model again. And uh, some of the things we're doing is looking at layering on top of this very simple model, a much more complex structure about how people interact with each other uh, by age and also layering on demographics that might be different for developed countries versus developing countries and you might recognize the sort of beehive and the exponential curves that um, are at the top panel on the right. I want to just draw your attention to the middle panel on the, on the right. Uh, what we have here is uh, uh, when you have a contact, two person contact, it shows the age of one person and the age of the other person. So uh, that's typical for different countries. So what you can see is people like contacting each other of the same age, other people of the same age. So that's this very strong diagonal across uh, the first, that just have, focusing on the first square of the middle row. Is that panel B, A, B and C? Those are the ones we focus on. I think it's called D in my, sorry. So it's in the middle row. The third, okay, yeah, middle row. So it's called panel D. So thank you for explaining that. All right, see how people, we've got age on both axes. So people like meeting people of the same age. So that's that strong diagonal. And then these off diagonals are parent child groups. And then there's all sorts of other uh, random sort of um, uh, contacts as well that are not age specific. All right, so what we can do is use the fact use what we know about the way people mix with each other at school, at home and in the workplace to think about how we could relax um, these social restrictions without pushing our effective reproduction number above one. Um, next slide. And in particular, um, that applies to school closures. 
and using the fact that school students, that people of school age have very much less uh, symptoms than people are, who are older. So people of school age are, are expected, they are either much less infectious or they're much less susceptible or both. Uh, it's a little unclear which is which, is which at the moment. Um, so this, this is the same type of graph but looked at what happened in Wuhan uh, when um, social distancing measures were put in place. So this is the, the Chinese version of that um, mixing at the top left of that mixing matrix, that's under normal circumstances. And that can be divided into what happens at home where you see this very strong parent and sibling um, and couples. Um, so you've got the couples and the siblings along the main diagonal and then the off diagonal is the home and you see a little bit of kind of even grandparent difference. Then there's the work, which is adults who are mostly mixing with adults of working age. And then there's the school where you have the kids and then a couple of uh, dots for the teachers. When you impose restrictions like school closure, you end up with a blank dot. Uh, work, um, you know, the workplace can shut down apart from essential services, but home stays the same. So we can use these ideas to think about how we can uh, re restore some of this contact and what that will do in, in, and could we still uh, stay with a reproduction number under one and control the epidemic versus not. Um, I, that uh, information is still not ready to go in Australia, but I will show you some work that's been done elsewhere for the next slide, uh, where they've looked at um, the fact that children are less susceptible at, or less infectious or both in this paper. And then they've put that into a contact matrix and, and estimated what would happen if schools are closed versus open. So in COVID, uh, there's, so having a look at the bottom right panel, in COVID, there's very little difference between the schools closed versus the schools open um, outcomes. Whereas in influenza, there's a massive difference between the schools closed and the schools open outcome. And that's because kids with flu are very infectious. They're more, they're, super infectious. They spread it amongst themselves with their high contact rates, uh, but in COVID that does not seem to be happening. So the, result, the results that these authors suggest is that um, thing, uh, policies aimed at halting transmission in children have minimal effects. So we can reverse that and say policies that allow children to mix will also have minimal effects in the, in the negative direction as well. So uh, that is uh, why I've been suggesting that school closure needs to be reversed. Um, and that's probably the first thing we need to do to get out of lockdown. Uh, next slide. Okay, and finally, I'll quickly talk about um, testing and tracing as a potential way out of lockdown. So we've, we're building a, an agent-based model where every individual in Australia can be represented and they go to school and they go have a household and they go to work. Uh, and what we uh, are going to look at is how the testing regimen can be used to think about whether if we do extensive contact tracing and testing and maybe ring testing and so forth, different strategies for testing and tracing, whether instead of having general and broad social distancing strategies, we can apply social distancing strategies just around where we're finding the virus and let people outside of those sort of um, areas uh, relax and have a uh, greater number of contacts. And how, how extensive would our tracing uh, have to be? And we will get inf more information about that in the coming weeks. And potentially that's where this um, app that the government's trying to sell to Australians might come into play, where we can um, look at the way people are contacting how much, how extensive people's contacts are and then pinpoint uh, the people who have been diagnosed with COVID and all their contacts as a strategy to allow the majority of Australians just to go about approximately their normal business while the people around the cases who have diagnosed COVID uh, have to, I guess, be in a situation much like we all are at the moment. Uh, so I'll leave it there. Thanks, Emma. Diana, we'll pop over to you. And then there are quite a few questions, but I think perhaps talking about vaccines and emerging therapies will be useful. And then we'll come and, and take the questions. Okay. Well, 
Thank you. Thanks, Emma, for that amazing presentation about the model. So I am Diana Rojas. I'm a lecturer of Communicable Disease Control and One Health in the Division of Tropical Health and Medicine. And I'm an infectious diseases epidemiologist, and I've been working with emerging infectious diseases for a while. And I'm going to talk about clinical trials in emergency situations and focusing on COVID-19. Next slide. Diana, you're a little bit soft. Can I ask you to come a bit closer or use your yes. outside voice? Thank you. Yes. <laughs> It's much better. Okay, perfect. So I am going to start with a little bit of background. So uh, there is a research and development blueprint that is a global strategy and preparedness plan that allows the rapid activation of research and development activities during epidemics. And I think this is very important because as Emma mentioned, as, as we remember, the first cases were reported at the end of December. So it feels like it's been forever, but it actually has just been four months, right? And in four months, the world and the researchers and the doctors and everybody has been done so much in research and development and trying to fast track treatments and vaccines. So this is a big, big, big achievement. And this is because we, we had a global strategy beforehand. So the aim of this research and development blueprint is to fast track the availability of effective tests, vaccines, and medicines that can be used to save lives and avert large scale crises. So all these blueprints started after the 2013-2016 uh, West African Ebola epidemic, when we were completely unprepared there was no much research about Ebola. Ebola was discovered in the 1940s, and in all this time, there were no vaccines, there were no treatments for a disease that has a 50% case fatality rate. So with this uh, WHO blueprint, we, we did a priority, a list of priority diseases that Ebola was on the top of that list. Then there was MERS coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. SARS was also in that list. Zika virus that caused, that was a public health emergency of international concern of, in 2016. And then we had in that list something that was called disease X. And I'm going to explain this afterwards. So as we have all that strategy during the Ebola outbreak, some vaccines were able to be tested with a incredible smart a clinical trial designs. So they were reactive trials. They were not the regular clinical trials because as you know, the vaccines and treatments, they need a phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials, and that can take years. So for a, during the Ebola outbreak, uh, the world needed a vaccine as soon as possible. There were some vaccines that were not able to be tested during inter-epidemic uh, transmission because uh, Ebola is one of those emerging infectious diseases that comes and goes. So there is no inter-epidemic transmission. So this a specific trial, every, it was called the ring vaccination trial using the, the ring vaccination strategy that was used to eradicating smallpox, where each case was confirmed and then the contacts of that case and the contacts of the contacts of that case were vaccinated. And that vaccine was, a, the efficacy of that vaccine was tested during the outbreak. And after two months of the trial going on, we realized that the vaccine was close to 100%, and then all the people uh, started to get vaccinated. So that was the first step of being able to test vaccines and treatments during a public health emergency. Next slide. And just to clarify, the ring vaccination, that's a particular description of an approach where you, own, you vaccinate the contacts, is that correct? Yes. Rather you than doing trials first in a, in a whole population? No, that is actually a trial. So you detect the first case, you confirm that case, then you identify the contacts of that case, the contacts of the contact of that case, and then you, you make a, what is called a cluster. And then you randomize the intervention within, the, within different clusters. So people can be assigned to vaccination or the, unvac or the delayed vaccination in this case, because Ebola has a case fatality rate of 50%. So it was completely unethical to, to compare with a placebo. Thank you. Next slide. So in that list, we add something that was called the disease X that represents the knowledge that a serious international epidemic 
could be caused by a pathogen that by 2014 was completely unknown to cause human disease. So guess what? The disease COVID-19 and SARS coronavirus 2, it fits really well with the description of the disease X. So that disease that was not on the list, but it was going to be a threat for humanity and had a high potential to cause a pandemic. So the good thing with COVID-19 is that we have, as we had this list, we have in the pipeline some potential treatments and vaccines for other coronaviruses. Because as I mentioned before, MERS coronavirus and SARS were on that list. So there were a list of potential treatments that were tested in vitro and were ready to be tested in clinical trials once there was a new outbreak of those diseases. So that's why even just after four months of the first case being confirmed, and in January, the sequence was, the sequence of the virus was uh, published. At this point, we have already several potential treatments and we have a lot of vaccines. It's because we, we were ready for a new, a new potential virus that we didn't know which one was it, but we had some other coronaviruses on the list. Also, we, uh, WHO and the Blueprint created a master protocol. So it's like a clinical trial methodology that, can be a, that has inclusion criteria, exclusion criteria, and outcomes that are common for all the clinical trials. Next slide. So those trials and having a, a master protocol it's going to increase the chances of efficiently generating evidence. Because when, once you have a big case definition for the world, then you can run very small clinical trials. That is what is happening worldwide. So in China, a hospital, they want to run a clinical trial. They are able to enroll 20 people. Then in Italy, they are running another clinical trial in the hospital, and they are able to enroll 15 people. So if you, if you run different clinical trials and you don't have common outcomes and you don't have a common methodology, it's going to be really hard to gather enough data to have a sufficient information to make recommendations. So that's why the master protocol is, is very important and is key in this situation. And then once you have that, you can also evaluate multiple interventions at the same time. So that's why you can test different treatments all over the world and then trying to gather data about all of them. And you can, and something that is happening with COVID-19 is that they, for, for example, for the Ebola, uh, out, during the Ebola outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo, that just ended a few weeks ago, uh, some treatments were tested for Ebola, but those treatments, uh, we, they were also looking for in vitro activity against coronaviruses. So we had some antivirals that were used for Ebola, and then those, can be, those are antivirals, so it can be translated to COVID-19. And that's one of the beauties of having simultaneous evaluations of multiple interventions and extending across uh, multiple infectious disease outbreaks. Next slide, please. So, well, so now I'm going to talk about the solidarity clinical trial that is this a large international clinical trial to help find an effective treatment for COVID-19. So there are four specific treatments that are being evaluated currently worldwide. One is from Desivir, that is an antiviral that was tested for Ebola during the outbreak in the Democratic Republic of Congo and had some, has shown some in vitro activity against coronaviruses, MERS and SARS, and also COVID-19. Then lopinavir, ritonavir, that are um, antivirals that are widely used for HIV. And in vitro, they have shown also some activity against coronaviruses. Then the combination between lopinavir, ritonavir, and interferon beta-1 alpha. And the well-known uh, chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So 350, there are 351 active clinical trials currently. And remember, it's been four months. So this is something like completely unprecedented. We didn't have this before during previous outbreaks. And now we have a lot of clinical trials running at the same time. We have a master protocol that we hope everybody is following all the criteria, but also there is a lot of open data sharing because we know that the earlier the data is shared, maybe the earlier 
we can take decisions in public health and maybe for, for clinical management. So you're going, I guess you are seeing a lot of publications, but not peer review. So from these 351 active trials, I will be very cautious in making recommendations about all these uh, medications or treatments or potential treatments, because we don't know exactly which methodology are they using. So some of the trials, for example, they don't even have a comparator arm. They don't have a placebo arm. So they are just, it's a description of what they saw, but that's not a clinical trial. To be able to measure the efficacy of a treatment, you need to have a, a control to, or a control arm. And for example, with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine, it, it has shown good results in vitro and in some clinical trials, but the sample sizes are about 20 patients. So that is not an, an enough sample size to make a recommendation of doing treatments or even prophylaxis for COVID-19. Also, we have to be very cautious with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine because they have a lot of adverse events like QT prolongation, hypoglycemia, retinopathy, mental status changes. So we have to be cautious, like even with patients with malaria, when you are trying to do a malaria prophylaxis, you have to be cautious with chloroquine and hydroxychloroquine. So more if you are having a patient that is infected with COVID-19. So there is not enough data yet about these treatments to make decisions. Next slide, please. So, well, so these are the, some of the papers that are published about remdesivir with uh, patients with severe COVID-19. So the outcomes in some, in some of, the, of these um, clinical trials, the outcome is uh, that they evolve to severe disease. In other ones, the outcome is uh, the case fatality rate or, or fatality, but still there is not enough evidence for any of that. Next not conclusive evidence yet. We might have it and I will put most of my hope in finding a, a treatment because that is going to be faster and some of these treatments are available already. So that would be, that would be, that would be a very good intervention if, it's, if, if one of these works. Next slide, please. So there are some other treatments or interventions that have been tested and not, they are not included in, the, in this solidarity trial but they have been tested for clinical trials in, in many countries. So one is the efficacy of the VCG. That is the, um, the mycobacterium bovis uh, VCG that is used mostly in low and middle income countries to prevent severe tuberculosis in, in kids. And whoever is born in a low and middle income country, we get it during the first day after being born, but it's not used anymore in developed countries because it doesn't have much uh, efficacy against tuberculosis. But apparently it causes a very interesting immune uh, response, a T cell immune response. And there are some ecological studies suggesting that it might have an impact on COVID-19 that immune response, that, that, like that acute immune response that causes the BCG. So there are several clinical trials trying to establish if there is an impact of COVID-19 in healthcare workers, once they comparing the ones who receive the BCG and compare with a, with a control arm. There are some monoclonal antibodies, uh, IL-6 receptor antagonists, also the use of convalescent plasma or hyperimmune immunoglobulins, Ivermectin, and every day I find new and new and new potential treatments and vaccines that, uh, that have been tested. So, so Diana, um, yes? what would be realistic, and Emma, this would be for you as well, I think. I mean, obviously, uh, any kind of evidence around any of these interventions is going to have an impact on which model can be followed and how we can exit. What would be realistic to think uh, in a timeline that we may have some substantive evidence uh, for any of these? Well, I guess most of these treatments are to prevent severe disease and to prevent the evolution to death, right? So if, we, if at some point we have a treatment that can prevent uh, severe infections and uh, getting people into the ICUs and then 
dying, that would be a very good intervention to decrease the impact of the public health impact and the, the impact in the health system, right? But the treatments are, might not reduce transmission. So it will have to be a combination between the suppression strategy that uh, Emma mentioned combined with a treatment. So once we have a case, we can start a treatment as soon as possible and we will avoid that person to get a severe infection and maybe die due to COVID-19. I don't know, Emma, if you have any other Emma, what are your thoughts? Yeah, um, thanks. I, I don't think treatment is gonna be our way out of, um, out of this. If you look at other diseases like influenza, we have a treatment for influenza, it works a bit, and it probably protects people against the most severe types of influenza and shortens the duration a small amount. But it's not really an effective way of stopping of changing the epidemiology. It doesn't really shift the curve. It may, and, and I think the same will be true of these COVID um, treatments. They may reduce the, the death rate by a small amount in developed countries, uh, but they're unlikely to sort of make a dent on the epidemiology. Uh, and unless, unless they can really significantly shift the death rate, it probably won't change our strategy. Thank you. Look, I'm very aware of the time. We do have quite a few questions. So maybe, Diana, we'll get you do the vaccination slide and then we'll, we'll do questions. Is that all right? Yes. Next. Well, here I just want to mention that there are several coronaviruses that causes disease in animals. And most of the coronaviruses vaccines target the S protein, that is the structural protein. So I guess if we are aiming for a vaccine, the vaccine will target that specific protein. Next slide. And well, as I mentioned, there are a big list of treatments. And at this point in four months, we have 115 vaccine candidates. So that, that has been a lot of research and a lot of work like worldwide trying to find a, an answer or a potential a prevention for, for COVID-19. So 78 of them are confirmed active against COVID-19 and 37 are in research. And 33, 73 are in preclinical development. That is the first phase of every of development of any vaccine or any treatment. And five already started clinical development. So I guess that is what I call fast tracking a vaccine. And there's a question, Diana, is this the fastest ever? Like what's the fastest time from disease emergence to marketed and available? I, I, well, we are still a long way from marketing and, yeah. and the, the vaccine. But I guess this is, this is a, a, a record on developing a vaccine. Like four, it's been four months, literally, because the, the, the sequence was published at the beginning of January and we are mid-April. So it's been four months and we have 115 vaccines. So I guess this is a, this is a new record for vaccine development. And we have already five in clinical development. So they are, they are already being tested in humans, in voluntary humans, to test if they are safe. So, and so the next step will be to test if they are safe and if they generate, they are immunogenic. So if they generate actually an immune response, that that's what you want when you, when you are doing research. And that's the big question, isn't it? Do we know yet with respect to vaccine development, are there anything, any mutations in the target proteins? Is, are you aware of any, ever, ever any news on that yet? It, well, the virus is mutating because we are in a pandemic. So that's, that's normal to see mutations uh, of the virus during the pandemic. But we don't know if it's going to mutate like other respiratory viruses do. But, do we, sorry, do we have any um, knowledge yet about the cost? that might be faced for, for a vaccination? Well, I think first we need to have a vaccine <laughs> yeah. because it, we have 115 vaccine candidates, but I, I don't want to be pessimist, but most of the vaccines, they don't make it to phase two. So most of the vaccines can be safe, but they, are, they do not produce an, an uh, immune response. So, if we have 115, let's say that maybe four or five are going to make it to phase two, and maybe one, being hopeful, one or two can make it to phase three. So still we have a long way to go with vaccines. I, I won't put all my hope in having a vaccine in the near future. So Emma, over to you then. A couple of questions about the modeling. Firstly, 
has there been any economic um, impact about the different models as far as you know has, has that been applied and secondly if and completely what Diana says is correct a we assuming there's going to be a vaccine that works but and b if there is one that's going to take a long long time so how does that impact the models the exit strategies okay first one um, yes it's very important to to think about the economics of the situation and apply economic models the sorts of economic models that are relevant here are not the kind of models that you sort of plug in alongside um, epidemic models where you can just simply count cases and count costs associated with cases. The sorts of models that are needed here are more macroeconomic models, whereas um, I'm used to dealing with sort of more microeconomic models because the big issues are the impact of changes in trade, changes in travel, unemployment, and, and all the shocks that go through every part of the economy as a consequence of that. And really that doesn't, that doesn't need uh, to be sitting alongside um, a infectious diseases model. I think we can all see that, that we've put a huge shock to our economic um, framework. And uh, yeah, I mean, they, they are being done and they will be done. And, and, and I'm talking with e economists about it, but I don't think they need to be integrated with um, infectious diseases models. They sort of run alongside each other where we can say, well, if we, if we can withstand um, this phase, what are the economic implications versus if we have a large effort? So we can look at the different economic implications of control versus the mitigation by looking at the impacts on the markets in Australia versus America versus the UK. I don't think, um, I, th I think they're very, very important, but I don't think they need to be um, developed in an integrated way with the infectious diseases models. Thank you, Diana, do you know where Australia is placed in terms of vaccine development? Are we doing anything locally? Yes, so Australia is part of the, of the solidarity trial, so they are several clinical trials that have been done in, in Australia. And with these vaccine candidates, at least a couple of them are from Australian researchers. So I guess we have... A any of the ones in clinical trial or not? No, they are mostly preclinical. Okay, thank you. And just before we move away from vaccines, uh, what, what in your knowledge is the fastest you could get to the development of millions of doses of vaccines? So say there's a candidate that is successful. Are we looking at 12 months, 18 months, 24 months? Well, let's say that the vaccine works and has a very good immunological let's, response. Let's say that. Let's, let's have it on our let's list. Let's say between 18 to 24 months. 18 to 24 months. From when? From which point? From the start of clinical trials or the finish of the clinical trials? No, no, no. I will say once in, in phase two, if a vaccine is showing that it has potential, it might go to phase three trials and with, with interim results. And once the, the, the sample size is completed, as we are in a pandemic, that's the main problem when you are evaluating a vaccine, is that if you don't have transmission of the disease, it's very hard to measure the efficacy. But now we are in a pandemic. So once we have a product that is safe and it also generates immune protection, then it might move very fast to, to efficacy. And if there are still cases, you can get efficacy data very fast. So let's say 18 months. Once the, phase, mm -hmm. once the phase two, phase two trial is available, and because after that, you need to move to the manufacturing, and the manufacturing 7 billion doses, that is when it's going to get complicated. Thank you. I'm very aware of the time. Lots of questions we're not going to get to today, but perhaps I'll, Emma might leave you with the last word. We'll go back to the models. We, this was about exit strategy. So if you were to pin yourself on one particular or two particular strategies, which ones would you go for at, at this stage and why? You're on mute, Emma. Realised. Okay, sorry. Okay, so I think to uh, to get Australia out of our current lockdown, we need to maintain uh, strong controls on travel, international travel. We need to get the numbers of, of local cases right down. Uh, and then the first things we, I would release are the schools, and that's because children are not contributing to the epidemic uh, nearly as much as adults. 
Uh, and then if we could just increase testing and contact tracing, I think that's the way to get uh, people back to a relatively normal life because what happens then is the focus is around the people with the virus rather than uh, everybody. Uh, so testing and tracing and contacts and ring lockdowns of, of places where we know there are contacts uh, and, and, and uh, yeah, just really vigorous contact tracing. So I think they're, they're the next steps. Thank you. And uh, I want to ask more questions, but we are way out of time. So it remains to Sorry. thank you very, very much, both of you. Could we go, Brie, to the last the slide that's just showing next week? Uh, sorry, we'll have to keep, you just go through that next, next. Sorry, Diana, we had to skip all those slides mm. next. But just to let you all know that, ne no, sorry, Brie, back one. Next week, we're going to look at COVID in pregnancy and the newborn, the emerging evidence around that and how to manage that. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for dialing in. Thank you so much to Diana and Emma. And we hope to bring you back in the near future for an up another update. So good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you very much.